Hello everyone, I'm Amy. How are you today? Hope everyone is doing well. Today is day five of week three. Today we'll be talking about living love and the confident assurance of God's love. Memory verse is, consider the kind of extravagant love the Father has lavished on us. He calls us children of God. It's true. We are His beloved children. 1 John 3, 1. So, what would happen if we lived in the absolute assurance of God's love? We all know God loves us. So what Wendy is talking about here is living as if we really, really believe that God loves us. Believe it deep down to the marrow of our bones. The kind of knowing and believing that leads to a confident assurance that we are daughters of the King. A confidence that stays even when the little voice in our head or the circumstances of our lives scream otherwise. An absolute assurance that allows us to process everything that enters our lives through the filter of God's deep and abiding love. An assurance that not only allows us to live loved, but also to confidently live out that love. John speaks to the kind of confidence and assurance as he closes 1 John 3. So let's look into that and see what John has to say. And I'm going to have to apologize and go grab my uh, Bible because I left it in another room. So I will be right back. Okay, I apologize. So sorry about that. I hardly ever do that. I don't know what I was thinking. I just picked my stuff up. Came in here to tape this and just clearly forgot my Bible. But it's okay. We're human. We do that sometimes. So we're going to look up First John. And I grabbed my phone rather than my Bible because... Like I said, it's in the other room. And to keep from being disruptive, I'll just do it this way. So we're looking up 1 John 3, 19 through 24. And we are going to be reading from the English Standard Version, which says this. <clears throat> By this, we shall know that we are the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, in a, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he gave us. So again, that was 1 John 3, 19 through 24. The question is, this is how we know that we belong to the truth. Emphasis added. To what does this refer? Verse 19 continues, how, And how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. How do we set our hearts at rest in his presence? Here's how this verse reads in the New Living Translation. And uh, guys, as if you all know me, I'm not big on the New Living Translation. Uh, however, Wendy does use this quite a lot in her book, and it's each to their own. Um, it is not something that I go by, so I, I just want to make that clear. But I'm going to go ahead and read it as she does in her book. 
Um, so here we go, and it's, uh, she said it reads like this in the New Living Translation, and it says, our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. John tells us that our relationship with other people directly affects our relationship with God, and I believe that's true, because a lot of times, um, our relationship, I've seen it a lot more in relationships with, um, people and their fathers, so, um, I've seen it in relationships, um, like where the father and the child doesn't have a good relationship and the father is hurting the child in some kind of way and their relationship is broken, then they reference that to God their father. Um, I've seen that quite often. And it's, it's disappointing because God is so much bigger than that and, and his relationship in our eyes shouldn't even reflect our relationship with our father here on earth because no person can ever hold up to what God is or anything. So, um, but, you know, we are searching for um, that desire in our heart. So it would be natural for us to try to um, fulfill that through our, heaven, our, through our father in, instead of our heavenly father. So it's completely normal. Uh, broken relationships hinder our communion with the Lord. John provides a formula to protect against broken relationships. It begins with putting love in action. Before blogs, Facebook, and Pinterest, people had to use hard copy cookbooks, old-fashioned cookbooks. When my daughter Lauren was young, we created one together, a complete compilation of all family recipes passed down through the years. One evening, I turned to one of those tattered pages with folded down corners and found an old favorite. I labored throughout the day, creating my grandmother's delightful and delicious recipe. I could hardly wait for my family to gather around the table that night. My husband, Monty, usually arrived home on a on or before 6.30, so that was the appointed time to gather. The kids and I sat down for dinner at 6.30, but no money. 6.40, still no money. 7.50, still no husband and no call. Where could he be? So rude. By 6.55, when the phone finally did ring, I was fuming, and I ignored it. I told my kids to eat. When he finally walked in the door at 7.00, I greeted him with narrowed eyes and the silent treatment. Not just for the moment, but for the rest of the evening, I was furious. How could he be so thoughtless? How hard is it is to pick up the phone and call? That night, I chose to nurse my hurt feelings. My anger ruled and reigned over my heart. I was mean, just plain mean. And it felt good. Ever been there? I know that I have. I've took on the wrong attitude many times. But you know what? It always ruined my attitude and ruined my day instead of ruining the other person's day in which I intended it to ruin. That night, I chose to nurse my feelings. My anger ruled and reigned over my heart. I was mean, just plain mean, and it felt good. I looked back now and think how differently this night would have been and would have ended had I been equipped to combat my anger and hurt feelings. But I had nothing except my emotions from which to pull, and they ran wild. What if I had found a formula, a process in place to protect me from being led by my emotions? A formula is a rule of or method for doing something. For example, a mathematical formula is is group of symbols that express a relationship or are used to solve a problem. Don't even ask me about mathematical symbols. It was my worst subject in school, and it was also my worst subject. Um, I struggled in English and math, but I do know God's Word. Thankfully, it doesn't contain mathematical symbols, but it does contain truths, truths and promises that when taken together, can be used to solve a problem. 
had I found a formula hidden in my heart to speak to the anger that invaded my heart that evening, I would have solved my problems with my husband in a more God-honoring way. His word would have re reigned in my out-of-control emotions, silenced my tongue, and even softened my cutting eyes. Let me replay the night, but this time with a prepared mind, a formula to follow. 6.30 arrives, no money. Thoughts seep in. Where is he? Why hasn't he called? He knows we eat at 6.30 every night. He always calls when he is late. Anger kicks in at this time. But then I remember the verse posted above my kitchen sink. I walk over and read them. Remember, Wendy, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 1. Wendy, only a fool gives vent to her anger. A wise woman keeps herself under control. You, my daughter, are a wise woman. Proverbs 29, 11. Wendy, be kind and compassionate to your family. Forgive them just as I have forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 In the heat of my anger, I took my formula and look, I looked to my formula, to the powerful, life-giving, life-transforming, mind-renewing words of my Savior who only wants the very best for me, my marriage, and my family. When I read them, God reminds me of his character and who he wants me to be. The Holy Spirit softened my heart. So, when the phone rings at 6.50, I answer it. I hear my husband's sincere apology and I accept it. He walks in the door at 7 after a long day's work, forgiven and ready to enjoy a wonderful meal with his family, experiencing grace, love, forgiveness, and joy, which, my friend, is a better scenario. My formula helped me put love into action, to walk in obedience, Walking in obedience deepens our walk with God, as our walk with God deepens our confidence in Him, strengthens. Now, how much better would our life be if we did this every time we had the opportunity to do this? Oh man, I just wished that I would do this every time I had that opportunity. It would make my life so much less stressful. And it would be such a great way to have such a better life, wouldn't it? Um, I certainly uh, appreciate her putting this in this book and turning that scenario around and letting us see how it turned out to be better when she did it the way God wants us to do it. And we need to always remember, remember we have an enemy in this scenario. He is the deceiver, and he operates in the darkness. He schemes, he prowls, he waits for moments like this to attack, to distract, to divide. But God never leaves us without hope. In 1 John 3.20, John gives us great hope. Sometimes our hearts excuses, accuses us. We hear, you are not strong enough, you deserve better. God doesn't listen to people like you. You'll never change. Oh, I have heard the accuser whisper that last lie into my life again and again and again. I'm so thankful that I no longer believe that lie. Jeremiah 17, 9 describes our hearts in words that are hard to hear. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? The answer to that question is God. God knows how wicked our hearts are. And yet, He still loves us, and He is for us and not against us. The enemy of our soul wants us to fight. He wants us to fail, and He wants us to flee. He works hard to draw us away from God, to rob us of our assurance of God's unconditional love for us. John speaks directly to Satan's strategy in verse 20. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and He knows everything. Our God is love, and He responds in every circumstances and in every way in love. He cannot do anything but love. Be ever so careful to not allow the devil 
the Debat be divider, the accuse you and rob you of your confidence. We are daughters of the king. Nothing we do or say will ever take that away. Whenever we make mistakes, lose it, or struggle to forgive, God will forgive us if we confess that sin. We need not and must not allow Satan to use confessed sin to accuse us ever again. Goodness, we should never be harder on ourselves than God is. Self-condemnation is not from God. God knows our hearts. When we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. To move it, remove it as far as the east is from the west. To wash us as white as snow. 1 John 1, 9, Psalms 103, 12, and Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 1, 18. So, if you're feeling less than, and yes, I was feeling less than this morning, unworthy or not good enough, that was me today. Remind yourself, and that's something I need to do today, of who you are, forgiven and redeemed, and whose you are. You are a daughter of the King, and greater is he who lives in you than he who lives in the world. So, let's read the story from Peter's life that speaks to the very truth. Peter denied the Lord three times just before Jesus' death. Without a doubt, Peter felt great remorse for the betrayal because Scripture tells us he went outside and wept bitterly. But we see from Jesus' words after his re resurrection that he knew Peter's heart. He knew Peter had repented. Read Luke 22, 54 through 62, and Mark 16, 1 through 8. Did you notice? So we're going to read those now. We're going to go to Luke. And we are going to look Luke 22 up. And we are going to read... 54 through 62. And then we're going to go to Mark 16. And we're going to read 1 through 8. And it goes like this. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him. From here to is a Galilean. But Peter said, Him? No, Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And, met, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered that the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us for the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the, st the, tomb, the stone had been rolled back, and it, it was very large. 
and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, from, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Whose name did he specifically call out? The angel specifically mentioned one name. Of all the disciples, he singled out one. I'm certain hearing those words assured Peter that Jesus did not only love him, but also forgave him. Although Peter's heart may have condemned him, his Savior did not. May we receive the same assurance as we surrender our hearts and confess our sins to Jesus. Are you hearing words of condemnation? Is the evil one speaking lies over your hearts and minds? If so, I encourage you to write what those feelings below are. Then write these four letters over what you're hearing. L-I-E-S. Lies. Sit for a few moments with Jesus. Pray and confess with this Pray and confess what is on your heart. Now write these words. God is love. God loves me. I am forgiven. And over these words, write truth. Read 1 John three twenty one through 24. In this passage, John writes that a clear conscience allows us to come before God's throne of grace and confidence. God hears our requests because our hearts are aligned with His. Unburdened heart, allow us to boldly come before our Father. Our confidence lies in knowing we are living in obedience to His commands. Read 1 Peter 3, 7. How does this verse speak to what John teaches here? Read Psalm 66, 18. And then answer the same question. What encouragement. When we love, when our hearts do not condemn us, we walk rightly with God. A relationship that assures he hears and answers our prayers. John writes in verse John 3, 22, that we receive from him anything we ask. We must read this verse in accordance with a verse we will examine in a later chapter. 1 John 5, 14 says, We live in the bold confidence that God hears our voice when we ask for things that fit His plan. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. James 4, 3 adds another condition for answered prayers. What is it? Read Psalms 37, 4 through 5, which also adds to our discussion. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord and what happens when you do? What does it mean to commit your ways to the Lord and what happens when you do? Summarize what you have learned about prayer in these verses. 1 John 3, 22 through 22. 1 John 5, 14, Psalms 37, 4 through 5, James 4, 3. How has what we have studied spoken to you about your prayer life? Are there parts of your prayer life you want to change? If so, what steps will you take to do so? John closes this chapter by Again, reminding us of Jesus' words on abiding, Jesus spoke thoroughly on this topic so that we could comprehend the value he placed on investing not only our hearts, but also our time in our relationship with him. This is found in John 15. Abiding is key to walking in the confident assurance of God's love and his word. 
We, are, we comprehend the depth of his love through the sacrifice he made. Abiding helps soften our hearts to his words, even the hard words. Abiding tenders our hearts to respond in obedience to the Spirit's conviction. We desire to please him. We want to obey him. Abiding continually exposes our hearts to the character purposes and the voice of God. It's the daily symptomatic feeding of the truth that helps align our decisions, our emotions, and our actions with his standard of truth. We filter every decision through the lens of his word. It helps to ensure we walk in light rather than darkness, to live motivated by love and not hate. Abiding gives us the weapons we need to detect, defeat, and disarm the enemy. To recognize darkness, expose it to light, and claim victory over it. As we close our week, we have learned God's call to us to love others. Of that, there is no doubt. But to live a life of love, we must live loved. What do I mean by this? To live a life of love. We must first know and believe God loves us fully, perfectly, and completely. We cannot love others until we know and believe that truth. Jesus manifested his love for us through the greatest sacrifice of all. He gave up his life on the cross and died for us. True love manifests itself in sacrificial acts sacrificial action is laying down a life for another for whom we lay down our lives we may think we don't have much to give but we do we can speak words of encouragement we can pray we can forgive we can serve we just need to break out of our routine Invite God to open our eyes to see how we can live today. Small acts of love is these. A smile, an encouraging word, a physical touch, treating a friend to lunch, remembering the names of the serve, servers at the business you frequent, sending a prayer of scripture to a friend, bringing a meal to a working mom, where is God calling you to sacrificial giving? Imagine our world if we all made these exceptions of love the pattern of our lives. What if we let this prayer guide our Genesis thoughts, our first thoughts of the day? Father, help me be a blessing today. So if you'll join me in praying this prayer, if we commit to living and giving love, God will go before us and make a way for us to live, love, and give love, and be a blessing. So, I learned a lot uh, from this today, and I hope that you all did as well. So, I am going to close in prayer, and then we will start on our next study uh, lesson. It will be day one of week four, and it will be to believe or not to believe. Let's close in prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for this day, dear Lord. And I just ask that you uh, help us to recognize your unconditional love for us, dear God. I ask that you help us to love one another, dear God. Help us to, con show, com to show compassion to others, dear Lord. And help us to love them, dear Lord. Help us to take time to do things such as smile when people walk by us or, you know, um, buy them lunch or um, leave a note, dear God, or give them a hug, whatever it is, dear Lord. You know what their need is and you know how it would make their day if we just took out the time to just do some small little something, dear Lord. So I ask that you start helping us to desire to do that, dear Lord, and help it to be a part of our life, dear God. So as I um, come to you today, dear Lord, I just ask that you help us to take what we've learned in this lesson today, dear Lord, and help us to bring it forth, dear Lord, and put it into action, dear God. We love you, Jesus, and we ask you this in your name. 
Amen. Okay, I'll see you guys later. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.